from Marrakesh, Morocco at the United Nations Climate Summit. This is Democracy Now! Until January 20th, when this administration uh, is over, we intend to do everything possible to meet our responsibility to future generations uh, to be able to uh, address this threat to life itself on planet. With a climate denier about to move into the White House, Secretary of State John Kerry vows the Obama administration will continue to battle the climate crisis in the remaining two months before Donald Trump takes office. But will Obama stop the Dakota Access Pipeline? That's the demand by thousands of activists who took to the streets across the country Tuesday, from Los Angeles to just outside the White House, where Senator Bernie Sanders unexpectedly joined the rally. We say to President Obama, in any and every way you can, stop the pipeline. <laughs> We will air Bernie Sanders' speech outside the White House, then speak to his advisor, economist Jeffrey Sachs. We'll also talk to Tara Hauska of Honor the Earth and First Nations leader Kevin Hart of Manitoba, Canada. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Marrakesh, Morocco, the UN Climate Summit. Actions were held in hundreds of cities worldwide Tuesday to protest the $3.8 billion Dakota Access Pipeline, which would carry crude oil from the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota through South Dakota, Iowa, and Illinois. The project has faced months of resistance from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe representatives of more than 200 indigenous nations from across the Americas, as well as thousands of non-native allies, all fearing a pipeline spill could contaminate the Missouri River, the drinking source for millions. On Tuesday, protesters rallied from Vermont to California. Dozens were arrested across the country. In Mandan, North Dakota, at least 25 people were arrested as hundreds blockaded a highway and access to one of the pipeline company's construction yards. Massive rallies were held in New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and in Washington, D.C., where Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders spoke. The idea that at this moment in history, when the scientific community is crystal clear that we need to transform our energy system, that at this moment we have the fossil fuel industry pushing for more pipelines, for more dependency on fossil fuel is totally insane. Many of Tuesday's actions targeted the offices of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which has so far refused to grant energy transfer partners the final permit to drill underneath the Missouri River. In a joint statement by the Army and the Interior Department released Monday, the Army announced, quote, the Army has determined that additional discussion and analysis are warranted in light of the history of the great Sioux Nation's dispossessions of lands, unquote. This is Army veteran Nicole Goodwin. Today, six members of Iraq Veterans Against the War went to the office of the Army Corps of Engineers in New York City, asking them to stand down and stand with Standing Rock. Water is life, and the fact that this is happening to the Sioux people and other indigenous peoples around the world is, is a tragedy. And when will it end? It must be stopped. As actions against the Dakota Access Pipeline swept the country and world Tuesday, Energy Transfer Partners, the owner of the Dakota Access Pipeline, filed a lawsuit in federal court in Washington, D.C., seeking to, quote, end the administration's political interference in the Dakota Access Pipeline review process, unquote. In the court documents, Energy Transfer Partners said the delays to the pipeline's completion have already cost nearly $100 million, and that, quote, further delay in the consideration of this case would add millions of dollars more each month in costs which cannot be recovered, unquote. We'll have more on the Dakota Access Pipeline later in the broadcast.
Meanwhile, in Olympia, Washington, protesters have set up an ongoing encampment called Olympia Stand to blockade trains carrying fracking materials from the port of Olympia to the Bakken oil fields in North Dakota. The materials being transported by these trains are necessary to extract North Dakota's fracked oil, which is then slated to be transported to refineries through the contested Dakota Access Pipeline. The group Olympia Stand says the blockade is in solidarity with the resistance at Standing Rock. A new report by Canadian environmental groups says annual government subsidies of $3.3 billion to oil and gas companies undermine Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's plans to impose a price on carbon dioxide emissions by 2018. Oil Change International said, quote, the system is like taxing consumers when they buy cigarettes while giving massive tax breaks to tobacco companies that encourage them to produce more cigarettes. It doesn't make sense, Oil Change International said. Donald Trump's transition team is reportedly in crisis following the firing of former Michigan Congressman Mike Rogers, who'd been handling the team's national security affairs. Lobbyist Matthew Friedman was also fired from the team. This comes after yet another shakeup last week when Trump fired New Jersey Governor Chris Christie as head of the transition team and replaced him with Vice President elect Mike Pence. Sources reportedly say the firings have been orchestrated by Trump's son in law, Jared Kushner. The New York Times is also reporting world leaders are struggling to reach Donald Trump and are simply calling Trump Tower in efforts to reach him. The Times reports two of the first two calls Trump took following Tuesday's election were with the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah al Sisi, and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Democrats are calling on Donald Trump to fire Steve Bannon as his chief strategist. Bannon is the head of the far right wing Breitbart Media, which has been accused of being a haven for white nationalists. This is Nevada Senator Harry Reid speaking on the Senate floor Tuesday. By placing a champion of white supremacists a step away from the Oval Office, what message does Trump send to the young girl who woke up Wednesday morning in Rhode Island? afraid to be a woman of color in America. It's not a message of healing. If Trump is serious about seeking unity, the first thing he should do is rescind his appointment to Steve Bannon. Rescind him. Don't do it. Think about this. Don't do it. House Republicans donned red Make America Great Again hats Tuesday on Capitol Hill as they announced Wisconsin Congressman Paul Ryan will remain House Speaker. His renomination was unanimous, despite fears he would be ousted for not more fully supporting Donald Trump on the campaign trail. Ryan never unendorsed Trump, but did say he wouldn't campaign for him following the surfacing of that 2005 video in which Trump openly brags about sexually assaulting women. Los Angeles Police Chief Charlie Beck has said he will not work with the Department of Homeland Security to carry out President-elect Donald Trump's proposed mass deportation policies. In a 60 Minutes interview aired on Sunday, Trump vowed to deport up to 3 million people in response. Chief Charlie Beck said, quote, if the federal government takes a more aggressive role on deportation, then they'll have to do that on their own, unquote. Trump's recent promise to deport up to 3 million people comes after President Obama's administration has already deported more than 2.5 million people between 2009 and 2015, more than any other administration in U.S. history. In New York City, hundreds of residents have successfully organized to drop Trump's name from three apartment buildings on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. His name, which is currently spelled out in big gold letters on the buildings, will be removed next week after hundreds of tenants signed on to a dump the Trump name petition. The buildings are owned by Equity Residential, but Trump had previously been involved financially in those buildings. Physicians for Human Rights says at least four separate hospitals in Syria have been bombed since Sunday. The group says the airstrikes across northern Syria were carried out by either Russian or Syrian government warplanes. This comes as the Syrian government has launched a new bombing campaign against rebel-held eastern Aleppo, and Russian troops have announced a new offensive against Syrian rebels. 
imprisoned Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning is petitioning President Obama to grant her clemency before Obama leaves office. Manning is serving a 35-year sentence in the disciplinary barracks in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, after being convicted of passing hundreds of thousands of documents to WikiLeaks. She's been subjected to long stretches of solitary confinement and for years was denied gender-affirming surgery. And in Denver, Colorado, a jury has ruled not guilty in the retrial of Clarence Moses L., an African-American man who was convicted of rape in 1987 after a woman said she dreamed he was the man who raped and beat her in the dark. Moses L. has always maintained his innocence. In 2012, another man confessed to the attack. Moses L. was freed in 2015 after more than 28 years in prison. Uh, this fall, prosecutors decided to retry Moses L. despite the other man's confession. On Monday, a jury found Moses L. not guilty. This is Moses L. speaking on Democracy Now! about seeing his grandchildren for the very first time after he was released from prison last year. When uh, I was arrested for this case in 1987, uh, my youngest grandson that uh, I believe the camera showed him the other day when I came out, uh, a rail that was the size and the age of my son Anthony. He was three going on four. So to see my grandchildren, it was just overwhelming uh, uh, to know that my son had grown up into an adult and now he had children and to see those children, it was, it was just mind-boggling. I, I felt good about it, but it was just mind-boggling, because I couldn't really believe it, that I got grandkids. To see our full interview with Clarence Moses L., who has now been fully vindicated, go to democracynow.org. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Marrakesh, Morocco, the site of the U.N. Climate Summit, or COP22, the Conference of the Parties. Thousands of protesters gathered across the United States and the world Tuesday for a global day of action against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Protests were held in over 300 cities. In New York, dozens were arrested when protesters staged a sit-in outside the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers' office. Another 25 people were arrested in North Dakota. Protesters also rallied outside the White House, where Senator Bernie Sanders made a surprise appearance and addressed the protesters. The issues are very clear. For hundreds of years, the Native American people in our country, the first Americans, have been lied to, have been cheated, and their sovereign rights have been denied them. And today we are saying it is time for a new approach to the Native American people not to run a pipeline through their land. And we are demanding that sovereign rights of the Native American people be honored and respected. Uh -huh. And the second issue that we are here for this night is to understand that in, midst, in the midst of a major water crisis and a growing crisis in our country and around the world, we are not going to allow a pipeline to endanger the clean water that millions of people depend upon. And the third issue, the third issue is that everybody here understands that not only is climate change real, Not only is it caused by human behavior, but it is already causing devastating problems in our country and all over this world. It is totally insane, and future generations 
will look back on us now and say, what in God's name were you doing? Our job now is to break our dependency on fossil fuel. Our job now is to move aggressively to energy efficiency and sustainable energies like wind and solar and geothermal. The idea that at this moment in history when the scientific community is crystal clear that we need to transform our energy system, that at this moment we have the fossil fuel industry pushing for more pipelines for more dependency on fossil fuel is totally insane. So we say to President Obama, in any and every way you can, stop the pipeline. Tell the Army Corps of Engineers that we know, we don't need any more studies to know that in the midst of a great crisis, a global crisis with regard to climate change, every environmental study will tell you, do not build this pipeline. And if there are other approaches, such as declaring, declaring Standing Rock a federal monument, let's do that. I don't have to tell anybody here that we have a new president coming in who wants, who wants this country to become more dependent on fossil fuel, who is endangering, endangering the lives of our children and our grandchildren and future generations. What we have got to tell Mr. Trump and everybody else, we are not going silently into the night. The stakes are too high for the future of this planet. We are going to be smart, we're going to educate, we're going to organize, we're going to bring tens of millions of people, moms and dads and their kids. Together, together, to tell the fossil fuel industry that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of our planet. Thank you. That's Senator Bernie Sanders speaking last night outside the White House in Washington, D.C. Special thanks to Chris Belcher. As actions against the Dakota Access Pipeline swept the country and world Tuesday, the company behind the pipeline, Energy Transfer Partners, filed a lawsuit in federal court in Washington, D.C., seeking to, quote, end the administration's political interference in the Dakota Access Pipeline review process, unquote. We'll have more on the pipeline later in the show. But first, um, after break, we'll speak with economist Jeffrey Sachs, longtime advisor to Bernie Sanders. Stay with us.
That's opening ceremony by Laura Ortman. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman here at the United Nations Climate Summit in Marrakesh, Morocco. French President Francois Hollande has called on President-elect Donald Trump to respect the Paris Climate Accord, saying the deal is irreversible. Trump is a longtime climate change denier who's described global warming as a Chinese hoax. He's threatened to pull the United States out of the Paris deal. President Hollande addressed the plenary here in Marrakesh Tuesday. L'accord était historique. The agreement was historic, and what we have to say here is that this agreement is irreversible. It is irreversible in law. It came into force on the 4th of November. More than 100 states, accounting for two-thirds of greenhouse gas emissions, ratified it. The United States, the largest economic power in the world, the second largest greenhouse gas emitter, must respect the commitments they have undertaken. That was French President Francois Hollande speaking at the climate talks here in Marrakesh. As we broadcast, Secretary of State John Kerry is now addressing the summit. Donald Trump's threat to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord has joined, has jolted the U.N. talks here. Earlier in the week, the U.S. Special Envoy on Climate Change, Jonathan Pershing, revealed no one from Trump's transition team has reached out to him to discuss U.S. climate policy. This all comes as the World Meteorological Organization is projecting 2016 to be the warmest on record, smashing last year's record. We're joined now by the economist Jeffrey Sachs, director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. He served as an advisor to Bernie Sanders in his presidential campaign and to continues to advise Bernie Sanders, who we just heard speaking outside the White House. Welcome to Democracy Now! here in Marrakesh. Great to be with um, you and here. <laughs> so talk about what it means to be in Morocco at the U.N. Climate Summit, and it seems like every third word out of people's mouths is Donald Trump. Talk about his election and what it means for the issue of climate change. Well, first, there are 196 signatories of this Paris Agreement. They're here. Uh, 195 of them have no doubt that they're continuing forward. Uh, one place with the 4.4 percent of the world's population, our country, suddenly is saying, well, we don't know. Uh, but I think for the vast majority of the world, while they're worried and uh, dismayed by uh, the, the words coming out of Washington and out of uh, the team of uh, the, the president-elect, there's a very clear determination that everything is going to move forward. And when I sit in the technical sessions here, there's no doubt that we've already passed the tipping point to a low-carbon economy. Things are moving, the technologies are moving, the innovations that I'm seeing here during this week by uh, tremendous uh, scientific innovators is absolutely phenomenal. So they could try to go the other way, but they're not going to succeed. It could be, though, uh, quite a pitch battle in our country. Do you see the election of Donald Trump as... Do you see his election for sure, meaning he will become president of the United States? Let's put it that way. I do. Yes. And here you have Hillary Clinton. Maybe she will have mm, close to two million votes more than Donald Trump, more than um, Nixon and his victory, Kennedy and his victory, certainly more than um, uh, Al Gore and uh, the difference between Al Gore, who has surpassed uh, George W. Bush in 2000. Um, given that, what will happen now? You see mass protests in the streets all over the country. The New York Times reporting today that Donald Trump's transition team in disarray already fired two of his top advisors. Uh, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, seems to be in charge. They fired Chris Christie, who was the prosecutor who put Jared Kushner's father in jail, um, and anyone related to him, to Christie, um, fired now. Your thoughts? Look, uh, if... Uh... Donald Trump goes uh, in the way that uh, the, the rhetoric, uh, his rhetoric and others around him have portrayed, 
we're going to have a brawl in the United States uh, politically. It's everything will be tied up uh, in in tremendous uh, political conflict. For instance, climate change. Bernie Sanders is uh, absolutely right. Tens of millions of people will rally not to have the earth wrecked. I'm not convinced that it's all going to be the worst, so I think uh, we'll see. Why not? Uh, well, it just may not be, because it would be the end of uh, his effectiveness as president right at the beginning. He said he wants to have a trillion-dollar infrastructure plan. I support that idea. We desperately need to build infrastructure. If he's going to build the kind of infrastructure, like pipelines, that are never going to be used in the future, that are going to bankrupt the investors, that are going to uh, cost the taxpayers uh, tens or hundreds of billions of dollars, it's not going to happen. But if he says, ah, OK, we'll build smart, but we're going to build, then something could happen. Well, Trump has made no secret of his disdain for, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency. He promised to cut EPA regulations 70 to 80 percent. Well, I don't want to defend the guy. I just want to say that let's be ready to defend the right things, which is the climate change agreement, our need to move off of fossil fuels, uh, our need to protect the natural environment, to protect the EPA functions. So, of course, we should be ready to uh, be extremely active uh, and fully engaged in that. All I'm saying is that maybe the worst isn't going to happen, and he'll see beforehand not to wreck his presidency from the start by going in a direction that's opposed by the entire rest of the world. Your thoughts on Myrony Bell, the person he's put in charge of the um, what uh, the EPA the transition uh, yeah. working group, right. um, the transition team. He's been described as the number one enemy to the climate change community. His own bio highlights how he's been named a climate criminal by Green. Piece. Um, he's not a scientist himself, but completely no. denies the science, is proud of the support he's gotten over the years by the oil interests. Look, we're going to see the names that come forward. Some are absolutely frightening. I think that they're put on a list just to uh, uh, ruin our day. <laughs> but I think we're going to see uh, who the names are. Uh, that guy would be uh, a disaster at EPA. Uh, but he's not heading the EPA or being proposed for it, at least up until now. He's just he's heading a team. Uh, that uh, supposedly is, is picking the new name. So I'm only saying that we should be ready for absolutely defending what and our what fundamental— And what does that mean, that kind of organizing? What does that mean? For example, Donald Trump says he's pulling out of the Paris Agreement. What does it mean to resist it? Well, first of all, legally he can't, uh, and politically it would be a disaster, and diplomatically it would be a disaster. The whole world would put the U.S. as a pariah. What it means for me, first of all, is if, if terrible names are proposed, I expect the Democrats to filibuster, plain and simple. We cannot let people that are going to wreck the country, wreck the future, into office just because somebody's named. Uh, we know that uh, Democrats have uh, a lot of uh, power if they choose to use it. I expect them to use it. I expect Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and other uh, progressive leaders to be saying we're not going to let our country get wrecked. That's what politics is. Mm -hmm. Um, we're talking to Jeffrey Sachs, leading economist, director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Um, you're still Bernie Sanders' advisor through the presidential campaign, and now, what do you see is Bernie Sanders' role? We just watched him standing outside the White House uh, giving this speech. Well, he's a political and a thought leader for tens of millions of Americans, and I think he's speaking the truth to the public, and that's why the public uh, resonated. Uh, we also know that he would have uh, beat uh, Donald Trump handily uh, had he been uh, in uh, the general elections uh, versus Trump. So he's a very, very important figure in America, and when he speaks, people are listening because he's speaking the truth. I want to turn to a clip right now. A federal judge in Eugene, Oregon, uh, named Judge Ann Aiken, has just ruled that 21 young Americans can proceed to trial in a suit against the Obama administration. The suit alleges that the government has known about climate change for decades but failed to address it, denying these children and teenagers their right to a safe future. 
Last year, Democracy Now! spoke to Aji Piper, 15-year-old Seattle resident and a member of Earth Guardian's Rising Youth for a Sustainable Earth. He's one of the youth plaintiffs in the landmark lawsuit filed by our Children's Trust. What concerns me most about climate change um, is, I mean, it's a, it's a very, like, hard thing, because you have to imagine, like, the future. Um, and we know, like, if we don't act on climate change, the world's not going to, like, end in, like, a flash and a bang. But what will end up happening is either my generation will feel the effects where we have to um, fight for survival uh, on the Earth. You know, life will be very, very different. It won't be, like, we won't be as privileged to live on the Earth. Um, it, it'll be a lot harder. But then also you think about, you know, we're putting generations um, that haven't been born yet. Um, and generations to come in the position where they have to deal with that. And that's not a position anybody should be put in. And it's just not fair. So it's a moral, logical thing. So tell us about the children's suit and what this means to go forward, Jeffrey Sachs. This is an extraordinarily important case because uh, these plaintiffs uh, have uh, alleged that their fundamental due process rights have been violated by the failure of the U.S. government to have a proper climate plan that's going to keep them safe, and that the United States government is not exercising its most fundamental public trust functions. And while the government then uh, made a motion to dismiss this case, the judge said, not so fast. There are real crucial issues that have been raised here, this has to go to trial. And this is a marvelous step forward. Now, the fact of the matter is, wh what is the business of uh, President Obama's Department of Justice defending such a claim? It should be standing with the children and saying, you're absolutely right. We need a plan. In fact, they should be saying, we're putting forward a plan, and we want to see it under court supervision. This is precisely the agreement that should now be reached with these plaintiffs. Mm. Back here in Africa, where we are, COP22 is being held in North Africa and Morocco. Some say the future of the African continent is not a priority here. On Tuesday, we spoke to Nemo Bassi, director of Health of Mother Earth Foundation in Nigeria. He said, quote, this is COP22. For us, it's like catch-22, because either direction, Africa is going to lose. The rich countries are forcing the process to go in the direction of polluters continuing to pollute without stopping pollution. And if polluters continue to pollute no matter how much money anybody makes from carbon trading, from carbon offsetting, like reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation, and all the other marks of marketed environmentalism. It's not going to add up to actually reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, which means the temperature is going to rise. So that's Nemo Bassi, your response. I don't think that's quite right, because Africa has a phenomenal amount of zero carbon renewable energy. The best sunshine in the world stretches across the Sahel. Countries like uh, Chad and Niger and Mali that desperately need electrification. Here you have the great solar energy potential, a tremendous uh, hydroelectric power potential uh, that should be tapped and can be tapped safely. So there's wonderful opportunities here. And I've been in workshops and seminars all week discussing very practically how Africa can move forward and also electrify the rural areas through microgrids. I was just in a workshop of leading engineers on that. I think there's a lot of excitement. Of course, Nigeria is a, 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 an oil country that has been despoiled by oil uh, and by the massive pollution in the Niger Delta. And one of the things that needs to happen in a country like Nigeria is a cleanup, and Shell needs to take responsibility for its historic role in that. It hasn't done so yet. Mm. Well, Jeffrey Sachs, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Any final comments as you head off to the last few days of this climate summit, what you want to see happen and what you want to see when you return to your country, to the United States? Look, the world's moving forward, the technology's moving forward, the decarbonization is moving forward. When I go home, I'm going to make that clear when I visit uh, congressmen and senators, when I talk to people across the United States. People may have to be out in the streets indeed if he tries to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. I think it will be the biggest political issue of our time if he tries to pull such a stunt. It would be the worst mistake at the start of a presidency, I think it would basically end the agenda of the presidency. And finally, as uh, your message to the Democratic Party. 
Do you simply think My they... message is stand up. Come on. This is your moment to defend the basic propositions and basic values. And if names are put forward that are outrageous, and a lot of outrageous names have been put forward, you got to act to stop that. And I'm expecting that. You continually were told, like many Bernie Sanders supporters, to step back, support the unity. That's what would be able to take on Donald Trump. Do you feel the Democratic Party made a terrible decision, squelching dissent? Do you think Bernie Sanders could have beaten Donald Trump? Bernie Sanders absolutely would have beaten Donald Trump. I don't think there's any doubt about that, and that's what recent uh, extensive surveys have shown. Because? And that's he would have beaten Donald Trump because he has the trust of the American people. And he still does, and that's why his voice is so important. So what do you think the Democratic Party needs to learn, the establishment, from a person, a candidate like Bernie Sanders in the future? Do you feel the Democratic Party handed the country to Donald Trump? Look, I think uh, the Democratic Party handed itself to Wall Street uh, uh, far too much in the last generation. We need a, a Democratic Party that is speaking the truth like Bernie. We need Keith Ellison at, at the DNC. Uh, we need uh, the leaders that are ready to take on the, the real battles. Why do you think Keith Ellison is important as head of the DNC, first Muslim Congress member? Because he has been the incredibly brave head of the incredibly brave uh, the uh, Progressive Caucus, the Democratic Progressive Caucus and uh, Congressional Progressive Caucus. Let me at least get that right. Uh, and he's been phenomenal in that role. And the Congressional Progressive Caucus has been phenomenal for the American people. They put out the people's budget. They've been the only ones telling the truth about fiscal policy. I'm including the mainstream Democrats in that, certainly the Republicans, but the Congressional Progressive Caucus has gotten it right. Why? Because they're brave, they're strong, and Keith Ellison's been leading them. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. Well, I want to thank you very much, Jeffrey Sachs, leading economist and the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, author of many books, including most recently The Age of Sustainable Development. His new article for the Boston Globe headlined Donald Trump and the Rebuilding of America. We'll link to it. This is Democracy Now! When we come back from break, we're going to look at the Dakota Access Pipeline and Energy Transfers Partner, Energy Transfer Partners, the owner of the pipelines, suit against the Obama administration, demanding that the government get out of the way so they can build DAPL. Stay with us. Looking at the world through the sunset in your eyes, juggling the train through clear Moroccan skies, ducks and pigs and chickens call. Animal carpet, wall to wall, American ladies, five foot tall and blue. Sweeping cobwebs from the edges of my mind. Had to get away to see what we could find. Hope the days that fly ahead bring us back to where they've led. Listen not to what's been said to you. Don't you know we're riding on the Marrakesh Express? You know we're riding on the Marrakesh Express They're taking me to Marrakesh All on board the train All on board the train I've been saving all my money Just to take you there I smell the garden in your Casablanca going south Blowing smoke rings from the corners of my mouth, my, 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 my mouth Glowing cottons hang in the air Charming cobras in the square Stripes your leathers we can wear at home Oh, let me hear you now Would you know we're riding on the Marrakesh Express? Would you know we're riding on the Marrakesh Express? They're taking me to Marrakesh Would you know we're riding on the Marrakesh Express Don't you know we're riding On the Marrakesh Express They're taking me to Marrakesh All on board That's Marrakesh Express by Crosby, Stills, Nash This is Democracy Now! 
democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from COP22. That's the conference of the parties. It's been going on for 22 years. We're in Marrakesh, Morocco. Actions have been held in hundreds of cities worldwide Tuesday to protest the $3.8 billion Dakota Access Pipeline, which would carry crude oil from the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota through South Dakota, Iowa, and Illinois. The project has faced months of resistance from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, representatives of more than 200 indigenous nations from across the Americas, as well as thousands of non-Native allies, all fearing a pipeline spill could contaminate the Missouri River, a drinking source for millions of people. The ongoing encampment in North Dakota is the largest gathering of Native Americans in decades. In Mandan, North Dakota, at least 25 people were arrested Tuesday as hundreds blockaded a highway and access to one of the pipeline company's construction yards. The water protectors said the protest was in honor of women who have been the victims of violence and kidnapping in North Dakota's male-dominated oil fields. I'm George. I'm a member of the Osuyas Indian Band. November 15th is the national day of women and you know it is it's very important that we stand together on this issue not only for our earth but for our children and our children's children if we keep extracting our resources as like we're doing now there's not going to be anything left for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and that is not the native way our indigenous way is to protect the earth so that we have something for our children Massive rallies were also held in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., New York City, where Curtis Ray Yaz of the Blackfeet Nation spoke. I've never mic checked before. I've never mic checked before. So let me warm up. So let me warm up. I'm from the Blackfeet Nation. I'm from the Blackfeet Nation. I've been in Standing Rock since August. I've been in Standing Rock since August. And everybody asks me, what is it like to be out there? And everybody asks me, what is it like to be out there? It's hard. It's hard. It's cold. It's cold. It's waking up cold. It's waking up cold. It's going to sleep cold. It's going to sleep cold. It's not sleeping. It's not sleeping. They have drones over our camp. They have drones over our camp. 24 hour surveillance. 24 hour surveillance. Bugs in our tents. Bugs in our tents. Informants in our meetings. Informants in our meetings. But what brings us forward? But what brings us forward? Day and day and day and day. Day and day and day and day. Night after night after night after night. Night after night after night after night. After being in handcuffs over and over and over. After being in handcuffs over and over and over. I know they will not stop. I know that they will not stop. Because we are not afraid. Because we are not afraid. Oh. Many of Tuesday's actions targeted the offices of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which has so far refused to grant energy transfer partners the final permit to drill underneath the Missouri River. In a joint statement by the Army and the Interior Department released Monday, the Army announced, quote, the Army has determined that additional discussion and analysis are warranted in light of the history of the Great Sioux Nation's dispossessions of lands, unquote. This is Army veteran Nicole Goodwin. Today, six members of Iraq Veterans Against the War went to the office of the Army Corps of Engineers in New York City, asking them to stand down and stand with Standing Rock. Water is life, and the fact that this is happening to the Sioux people and other indigenous peoples around the world is, is a tragedy. And when will it end? It must be stopped. As actions against the Dakota Access Pipeline swept the country and world Tuesday, Energy Transfer Partnerses, which owns the pipeline, filed documents in federal court in Washington, D.C., seeking to, quote, end the administration's political interference in the Dakota Access Pipeline review process, unquote. The company seeking to have the court order that Energy Transfer Partners already has the right to build the Dakota Access Pipeline without any further actions or permits from the Army Corps of Engineers. In the court documents, Energy Transfer Partners said the delays to the pipeline's completion have already cost nearly $100 million. Well, for more, we're joined by two guests. In New York, Tara Hauska is with us, National Campaigns Director for Honor the Earth. She's Ojibwe from the Kochiching First Nation. We last saw her when we were in North Dakota. 
Here in Marrakech, New, uh, Morocco, we're joined by Kevin Hart, the Assembly of First Nations Regional Chief of Manitoba. We last saw him Labor Day weekend when he was representing his nation at the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe Resistance Camp in North Dakota. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Tara, let's begin with you. Um, you're in New York. You were leading one of the protests yesterday in New York against the Dakota Access Pipeline. This is breaking news as of yesterday um, that Energy Transfer Partners, the company of uh, Kelsey Warren, uh, is seeking to stop the Obama administration from what he calls interfering uh, with the building of the pipeline. Uh, and they're saying they already have the right to build under the Missouri River. Can you respond to this suit? First of all, clean drinking water is not a political issue. Clean drinking water is a right, a human right, that we should all have in the United States of America and the rest of the world. Um, you know, to say that this is some type of interference, political interference, miscalculates what drink, drinking water really is. Um, you know, this company proceeded to build a pipeline without having the permit under the river. They actually admitted in, in federal court, they stated that they thought um, it was just a formality. And the judge responded and said, well, it's not a formality now, is it? Uh, these companies have been acting without any, uh, you know, any sense of needing the needing to follow the law, uh, needing to follow, you know, this permitting process, and just acting like everything's going to be greenlit and their interests come before the interests of the American people, including doing an environmental impact statement that was never done for this pipeline. You know, they allege again and again that it's so safe. Well, if it's so safe, then do an environmental impact statement. Well, explain that. What would an environmental impact statement involve, and why hasn't one been done at this point? Is this what the company is most afraid of? An environmental impact statement is a stringent level of environmental review. It's the highest level of review that the federal government can put on a project, which, which it, oh, it, it should on a project of this size. This is an 1,172-mile pipeline, um, a fracked oil pipeline going through multiple water crossings, um, you know, sacred sites, all these different things that the, that the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe is so concerned about and all the people that have come to support Standing Rock are so concerned about. Um, you know, it's a, it's a level of review that would require cumulative uh, impacts to be considered. So what is this pipeline going to do to the environment? What is it going to do to the public health? Uh, you know, where, where are these sacred sites? Uh, you know, is it going to impact so many different things along the, the uh, actual construction and then operation of this line? Instead, the company used Nationwide Permit 12 and segmented the pipeline into little bitty pieces and did an environmental assessment on these. So the lowest level environmental re review, Nationwide Permit 12 is something for a small-scale infrastructure project like a boat ramp or something like that. And that's how they treated a pipeline, a fracked oil pipeline. It's absolute madness and, you know, something that the company wants because they can get their project through faster. And they know that an environmental impact statement, if one was done, this project would never be approved. So what are you demanding right now of President Obama? I mean, they have not granted the permit for the pipeline underneath the Missouri. But you're not just concerned about President-elect Trump. What do you want Obama to do? He's still in power for two months. Yeah, and, you know, President Obama has visited the Standing Rock Sea Reservation. He knows these people. He's held these children. He understands, you know, Native America. He's been out there, and he knows, you know, the issues that face our communities, poverty, you know, all these different um, continued, uh, you know, continued situations of Native people living in the United States that are treated disparately, have less than, and are treated as less than. And so for this project to be happening, the largest gathering of Native Americans and the coming together of hundreds of indigenous nations, because extractive industry projects impact our communities disparately, because we know how this feels in our own communities, for him not to respond to this and instead say things like, we're going to let it play out over the next several weeks when Native American men, women and children are being maced and shot with rubber bullets and arrested. I just got arrested on Friday. You know, being zip tied and thrown into a dog kennel for six hours is not um, something that should be happening in this country. It's not something that, you know, should be overlooked and, and, and let to play out over several weeks. It's an abomination. It's a shameful moment for the United States. And so, you know, President Tara, Obama I, needs I just to— Tara, I just want to understand—Tara, I just want to understand what you just said. 
Um, what happened to you on Friday? Where I, were you and <laughs> where were you put? Yeah, I was uh, arrested for criminal trespass as I was, uh, you know, leaving a peaceful demonstration and getting into my car on a public road. Uh, they arrested us and zip tied us on the side of the road for two hours. We were then in thrown North into Dakota. jail and put in a dog kennel. And with, what do you mean a dog kennel? Yeah, it was a you know a large chainmail dog kennel for you know over six hours while they didn't even actually charge us with crimes. After that, I was strip searched. Um, and then thrown into jail, and finally, late, late that evening, was charged with a crime. So it's, you know, a situation in which this is happening right now. Native people are being hurt right now. Um, there were people being maced and tased again yesterday. Um, these things are happening, and so the administration needs to respond, and it needs to say, you know, either no pipeline, which would be, you know, the ideal, that's going to be a win for everybody, because clean drinking water is, you know, the future, and it's something that we shouldn't even be considering uh, putting at risk for an unnecessary and unneeded project. Um, but to do an environmental impact statement. If this project is so safe, then do one. You know, the, the company doesn't want to do this. It doesn't want to go through that process because it knows that this pipeline is unsafe. It knows that it would never meet those standards and this would never be allowed to happen. Tara, Tara Hauska, you, uh, you're an attorney. Uh, you're an indigenous leader. You've spent a lot of time at the Standing Rock Sioux resistance camp. You were the indigenous uh, advisor for Bernie Sanders. We just played at the top of the show the speech he gave outside the White House demanding that President Obama deny the permit for the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, your thoughts on where this movement goes now? Working for Bernie Sanders was, you know, a great uh, honor and privilege to be uh, in a role in his campaign and to contribute to that, but also to see grassroots mobilization and the power of the people. Millions and millions of people voted for Senator Sanders. And, you know, again, this is a, this is a you know, the Dakota Access Pipeline resistance is millions of people around the world coming together and trying to stop this single project, but also to make a stand about the relationship of people to fossil fuels, about indigenous rights, about all these issues. And so, you know, seeing that and these marches against Donald Trump and, you know, the power that's within organizing and the power that's within, uh, you know, local elections, um, there were some successes that happened, aside from just Donald Trump's election. There were several different, uh, you know, women of color and people that have never been re in represented office before. Um, you know, we have the power to, to change the conversation, to change the narrative. Um, you know, our, our social justice, environmental justice, um, all these different movements coming together and, you know, realizing that we need to stand together Tara, and uh, the, change the conversation, the, change the narrative. The head, the head of Energy Transfer Partners, Kelsey Warren, has said he's 100 percent confident that Trump will support the completion of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Warren donated more than $100,000 to Trump's campaign, while Trump has between, oh, half a million and a million dollars invested in Energy Transfer Partners. This is Kelsey Warren speaking on CBS. Once he takes over January 20th, what are the prospects? Oh, it's 100 percent. 100 percent that? That the easement gets granted and, and, and the pipeline gets built. Have you spoken to Donald Trump about the pipeline? I, I've never met the man. You've never met him? No. But he's invested in you and you're invested in him. <laughs> well, I wish him well. Your response, Tara Hauska, to Kelsey Warren. Kelsey Warren, who runs the Cherokee Creek Music Festival uh, in Texas, great fan of Jackson Brown, who apparently is singing a big event Thanksgiving Day weekend in support of the Standing Rock Sioux um, on the reservation in North Dakota. Uh, Kelsey Warren, the CEO of Energy Transfer Partners. I think this is a, you know, that's a perfect example of uh, the influx and uh, relationship of big oil to our current congressional system, to the government, to uh, our elected offices. I mean, this, these people have never even met, as he said, um, yet he knows because of, you know, Kelsey Warren knows because of Donald Trump's attitudes and because of, you know, the administration that he plans to bring in, you know, the, uh, his current energy advisor is someone also directly invested in Dakota Access Pipeline, um, that it's basically just a green light, that they're just going to go slam these projects through, and it doesn't matter um, if, it, if, the, if the people, the local people resist, if the local people say no. 
Um, in their minds, these projects matter more than the people. These, these profit margins matter more than human beings. Um, Tara, and so that's where we have to Tara come Hauska, together. I want to bring in. Um, I want to bring in our other guest today. Tara Hauska is with Honor the Earth. Has spent a long time now at the Standing Rock Reservation in support of the resistance. Kevin Hart is with us here in Marrakesh, Morocco. He is with the Assembly of First Nations in Manitoba, Canada. I last saw him on Labor Day weekend in North Dakota at the resistance camp. Um, this is an astonishing gathering of members of over 200 First Nations and tribes from across the Americas. Why do you think, Kevin Hart, this is so important, this gathering that you came to as well? Well, we know all too well that Canada is the biggest exporter of oil per exports to the United States. And that uh, for myself, as a leader from Canada, that it's very concerning that I have the portfolio of water and alternative energy. And when I was sent down to the Standing Rock Sioux Nation as an international observer for the Assembly of First Nations, you and I, of course, were on the ground and witnessed firsthand the violence that occurred to the women and the protectors on the ground. And then leading up to that, we see that the escalation of violence that's occurring on the ground in, at the Standing Rock Sioux Nation at the uh, camp there. How historic is this? Pardon me? How historic is this gathering in Native American history? How? Well, the historic part of it is we knew that uh, where the camp is situated, Standing Rock, that the last time a large gathering in camp occurred at that spot was just before the Little Bighorn Battle. Hmm. So you have gone from Canada to Standing Rock to here in Morocco. What are you demanding here? Why are you in Marrakesh? Obviously, you know that uh, climate change in the environment affects us all. Indigenous peoples across the world, we can say that we contribute the least effects to the environment and climate change. And yet, you could see that we feel the full effects when it comes to climate change in the, in the environment across here in Mother Earth. Um, Donald Trump has said he wants to restore the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline from Alberta tar sands, bringing that dirty oil through the United States down to the Gulf of Mexico. What would this mean, and what are you going to do about this? Well, obviously, this is, is going to have a devastating effect on Mother Earth and especially the sacred source of water that we all talk about. It's one of our most sacred sources of life for our people, according to the teachings that have been passed down since time immemorial. And for us, on the Canadian side, what we call the, the medicine line, because for us as Native American people on both sides of the border, there's never been a border there, including with our brothers and sisters in Mexico. So for us, we know that uh, it's a very contentious issue when it comes to pipe, pipeline development across Canada. You can see that north of the border in Canada, that First Nations people, Indigenous people, as well as peoples from all walks of life, color and creed, are having great concerns when it comes to the future of pipeline development, not only in Canada, but the United States. It's concerning that we see President-elect Trump indicating that he would uh, take the Keystone XL project that was you know, struck down by the Obama administration and pledged to uh, build that pipeline going down. And I just have to say that for myself as the Manitoba Regional Chief, that pipeline should be coming through my region, and he's going to have a hard battle with our First Nations people on that side of the border. Well, Regional Chief Kevin Hart, I want to thank you for being with us at the Assembly of First Nations Manitoba here in Marrakesh, Morocco, and thanks so much to Tara Hauska. That does it for our show. We'll be celebrating Democracy Now!'s 20th anniversary with Harry Belafonte, Noam Chomsky, Patti Smith, and many others, December 5th in New York City. Go to our website to join us and look at the details details, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with an amazing team here in Morocco, Marrakesh. Mike Berkman, Shea Carla Wills, Laura Gattis, Dina Guster, Sam Alcoff, Robbie Karen. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.